Hello, and welcome to the Lunchtime Discovery Series. My name is Tyler Dennis, and I'm serving as, the, as an intern in Exhibit Hall programs at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Today, I'll be your guest host for this lecture, stepping in for Chris Smith. The Lunchtime Discovery Series, <clears throat> sorry, let me clear my throat, is coordinated by the North Carolina Office of Environmental Education within the Department Hello, of Environmental Quality and broadcast Series. by the museum. Remember that, these, remember that these presentations are interactive. Feel free to type your thoughts, questions, and experiences on today's topic into the chat. After the presentation, I will look to you, the viewers, for questions to pose to today's guest speaker. Thanks in advance. Now, let's get started. Today's special guest is Dr. Joel Faudry. Dr. Faudry is an ecologist studying the populations and ecology of wildlife on our coast and a professor at the UNC Institute for Marine Sciences. Everyone, please welcome Dr. Joel Faudry. Thank you to the museum. Uh, I'm going to share screen. So give me one moment to make that happen. Tyler, if you'll nod that you're seeing the, the slide. Thank you. I'm also going to try to get a laser pointer option going on here. Okay, so you should be seeing a laser pointer on the screen. Great. So um, our lab group at the coast uh, studies ecosystems, broadly speaking. Um, small fish, big fish, seagrass habitat, oyster reef habitat, beach ecology, and sharks are, are one component of that ecosystem that we think is really important. And so we want to understand uh, their role in, in these communities uh, and in maintaining balance in these communities. And so I'm going to talk about a suite of research that myself and others have conducted out of IMS over the last several decades. I first just want to show you a few videos, and I've been more, and these may look a little grainy to you. Uh, these are videos that I've taken. So this is a beach near Cape Lookout, and you know, right along the beach. Uh, my son filmed this, actually, not me. There's all these sharks. Um, and if it replays, you'll notice there's a, a person walking along the beach. I think they're largely unaware of what well, was about 50 or 60 sharks that are right there in the very near shore. Um, and it looks to me like it's a mix of maybe black tips and black noses and maybe a spinner or two. Um, three foot sharks, four foot sharks, maybe a couple six foot sharks. Um, but sharks are a big part of the system by biomass and by regulatory roles. Uh, here's another video um, where we actually were trying to uh, catch sharks with a drum line. If you know the Beaufort, Moorhead City, Parker's Island, Cape Lookout area, you might know the Rachel Carson Reserve. Um, and this is right in the reserve. So this is water that's you know knee deep or can be 10 foot deep. And this was a, a nine foot lemon shark um, that we call. Uh, lemon sharks are typically you know more to our south. They do make it up this way. Um, so right there in the estuary. And then this last video is sort of a oyster reefy marshy shoreline and what you see is a dorsal and a tail fin of a bonnethead shark um, and if you didn't know bonnethead sharks before I want to introduce them to you and talk about some of their neat ecology uh, not a very big shark but certainly working in fairly shallow water um, eating things like blue crabs which are really important for the state of North Carolina um, and so we want to understand what roles uh, these sharks play a way of real, real brief background, and some of you know this stuff probably better than I do. Um, I'm not a shark-centric ecologist. I'm an ecologist broadly, but we do study sharks a lot because, again, they're part of the system. But I want to remind you really quickly that uh, sharks are one of uh, three super orders in uh, the cartilaginous fish category, along with things like rays and chimeras. We have sharks. Uh, different sharks have been around for a long time. The first sharks, you know, almost 500 million years ago, like I think that's the Devonian, shortly after the Cambrian explosion. Most of the extant shark species that we have showed up around 100 million years ago. So they've been around for a long time, longer than dinosaurs. Currently, there's about 500 species, of which we'll see about 50 different species in North Carolina, give or take. Uh, pretty dramatic size range within the sharks, everything from uh, 20 centimeters to almost 20 meters. That's two orders of magnitude in terms of size range. And pretty much anywhere it's wet and salty, uh, you'll find sharks. And even if the water's not salty, there's a few places where you can find sharks as well. 
uh, using my laser pointer. Um, there are eight extant orders, things like angel sharks and saw sharks, which are not to be confused with sawfish. Sawfish are a little bit different. Saw sharks have these barbels along their rostrum. Uh, the dogfishes, uh, which don't have an anal fin, the six and also seven gill sharks. Um, I've never actually seen one of those myself. They're not very common in our local systems. Uh, the carcharhiniforms are really the requiem sharks, the, the hound sharks, the cat sharks, and the hammerhead shark family. Those are the sharks that we see a lot of here in North Carolina. Um, very important uh, group of sharks. Uh, the mackerel sharks include things like great whites and makos. Uh, the carpet sharks are interesting because it includes things like nurse sharks and other sharks that kind of lay on the bottom, but it also includes the whale shark, which is the largest shark out there. And then lastly, um, the horn sharks. Uh, I was a grad student on the West Coast, and I used to see these all the time. Uh, they lay neat egg cases, um, but we don't have them in North Carolina. Um, if we do, it's very rare, or I'm not aware of them being a big part of our system. So that's some brief introduction to the sharks. So why do we care about sharks? Well, we know they play important roles at the top of food webs, um, both as apex predators, but also as scavengers, uh, picking off weak or injured animals. And I'll just talk about a couple of different ways that these roles manifest themselves to, to make that point. Uh, they're playing a regulatory role from the top down, but we think they also are integrating all sorts of signals from the bottom up. Um, if the food supply is different, if temperatures are different, um, sharks are going to integrate that information and their populations may respond in a way to tell us that the system is changing. So that's why they're important. Um, so one of the things about sharks is that they're really, really mobile. They're patchy in space and time. And that makes them incredibly hard to survey and work with. Um, they're not an easy uh, lab rat, if you will, uh, to do research on. And because individual sharks can live to be several decades old, it's hard to understand their population and community ecology with one or two or three year studies, to understand how communities and populations of sharks are, are changing or responding to things. It really takes uh, ambitious scales of study across space and time. And that's one thing that I think that IMS has served a valuable role in in terms of our long-term research, which I'll, I'll talk a bit more in a second. Okay, so to highlight this role that sharks can play in ecosystems, I, I really like this uh, example. And what it involves is it involves the sharks, sea turtles, and seagrasses. And if you don't know seagrasses, it's not the marsh grass at the edge of the water. It's, it's fully submerged aquatic vegetation, uh, marine angiosperms um, that are key habitats for little fishes and crabs and shrimp. Seagrasses bury a lot of carbon. They help keep the water fairly clear and clean. Really important habitats. So in a pristine system, you got this balance between the, the plants, the primary produ producers, turtles, which are herbivores in some systems and in some species, and sharks, which can eat turtles. And over time, through the last hundred years, we did a good job of removing essentially both the turtles and the sharks. And if you do that, the system can get out of balance because turtles don't only eat grass, but they eat algae and they eat sort of the tips of the grass that can get unhealthy. So the turtles, if kept in balance, can give the grass a good haircut but they don't mow it down. If you lose the sharks and you lose the turtles, you lose that ability to give the grass a haircut. The grass gets too long, it gets unhealthy and it can die. Algae can take over. And so in a world without sharks or turtles, you can lose your grass. Now, after we fished out a lot of the sharks and fished out a lot of turtles, we were left with this world where we didn't have either. Turtles are a little more cute and cuddly than sharks, and so conservation efforts for turtles kicked in a couple decades before sharks' uh, conservation efforts really kicked in. And so what this paper that I'm citing here, which is not ours, but I just think it's a good one, what this paper uh, shows is in a lot of systems, if you recover your turtles without recovering your sharks, the turtles can just graze on the grass with impunity and they overgraze. And so a world with lots of turtles, which we think we want, but no sharks is also a system that's out of balance. Uh, this is a picture taken from uh, Bermuda 
and outside of this exclusion device, all the grass has been mowed down. Inside the exclusion device where turtles can't get their heads in to feed, see it's a lot, it's a lot darker and greener. That's all the seagrass growing. It's important habitat, again, for little fishes and crabs and shrimps and to capture carbon and to keep the sediment stabilized. And so we really need a world where you've got enough of these big sharks going around scaring or eating turtles so they don't just feed with impunity and mow down the grass to nothing. So to me, this is a great example of the, the important role that sharks can play in a system in terms of maintaining balance. And it's not to make turtles the bad guy, it's just meant to highlight again that balance is the key. All right, so before I get into uh, the work that I'm currently doing or involved with here in North Carolina, I want to introduce you to what was my gateway into sharks. And that's with some non-traditional data uh, that I ran across in the Gulf of Mexico. So it's really hard to know the way the world used to be in terms of sharks. We don't have good records, generally speaking, of how many sharks or what sharks were out there. So it happens to be in the Gulf of Mexico, there are all these fishing tournaments that in some cases are almost 100 years old. And for 100 years, as these fishing tournaments have been happening, papers have been publishing data on what size sharks have been winning these tournaments. Now, I will say that this is an example from the early 1960s. And notice they don't even specify what type of shark. It's just shark. In the you know, 50s, 60s, even 70s, a shark was just a shark. Um, they don't differentiate between tigers or bulls always or lemons or any other species. It's just a shark. <laughs> but anyway, so for 100 years, we've got a record of what size sharks are winning these tournaments. The papers also have lots of good visuals. Here's just a couple. Um, I like this one from the 1920s. Um, this is actually a soft fish, not a soft shark. Again, it doesn't have the barbels. Um, but it's good to see evidence of, of these species showing up in the tournament. It's also kind of neat to see the way they used to dress and go fishing, right? They used to actually put on ties and coats to go fishing and duck hunting and that type of stuff. And then here's a photo from either the late 70s or the, uh, the early 80s. And you can imagine this photo like right out of Jaws, the movie, when they go on that big uh, shark hunting expedition, right? There's just sort of no sympathy for sharks. And it was sort of an adrenaline rush and sharks weren't good for anything. Uh, this happens to be a big tiger shark caught in Texas. Um, so lots of cool visuals. I learned a lot just from reading about 100 years of sort of postal focused newspapers in Mobile and Galveston and places like that. But the real thing is I just want to show you the data that came out of these, uh, the exploration of these records. So I'm going to show you data from three different tournaments, one in Alabama, one in Mississippi, and one in Texas. Uh, and the point here is that these are the size of winning sharks on the y-axis. This is time. The first 60 or 70 years, the sharks they were catching were getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Not because the sharks were getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but because the boats were getting bigger, the gears were getting better. You know, back in the 20s, they were catching sharks out of rowboats. And in the 70s and 80s, we're talking about, you know, the advent of, of location systems and things like that. Around the mid-1980s, the bottom drops out. And so the sharks they're catching now over the last 20 or 30 years are one third to one fourth of the size of the sharks they were catching in the 70s and 80s. And you see that same basic thing in Mississippi where the bottom falls out. And it seems to be the same sort of thing happening in Texas now. The Texas data are actually lengths, not weights. So if we plotted, the, if we could plot these data as weights, we'd probably see an even more severe drop. Now, I don't think this is just like a recreational fisherman of these tournaments killing all the sharks. This last graph is commercial longline shark harvest in the Gulf, which our National Marine Fishery Service actually tried to advocate for an increased shark fishery in the late 70s. And what you see is you see like a five or six year gold rush and they caught tons of sharks and then the bottom falls out. And it seems like this commercial longline fishery was just putting too much pressure on sharks. Um, sharks are kind of long lived. They have fairly low reproductive rates. They seem fairly teed up to um, be overexploited in terms of maintaining large sharks. And so this commercial effort peaking right here lines up really well with this, this drop in the sharks right here. One other reason I really like these tournament data is because 
we talk about this issue of shifting baselines in ecology and conservation where whatever the kids that are being born today see when they go out to the beach, that's their imprint of what nature looks like. And if that picture has been changing over decades, the kids, me, you, young people, even old people, I guess, in their time, don't realize that the system started out at a different point and it's been shifting, right? They just set a new baseline in their mind of that's the way the system looks. And so here's a picture from 2003, and this is a tiger shark. You can see the bands on the side. And it's a big fish. It's a 225 pound fish. It would scare me out of the water. And here's this kid looking at this shark like, wow, that's a, that's a big fish, because it is, and I get that. What this kid maybe doesn't realize, and what I appreciate more now from looking at these records is, just 25 years before this photo, they were pulling 900 pound tiger sharks out of the Gulf of Mexico. And this shark could bite this shark in half, literally. And this kid here may never see this 900 pound tiger shark. And so he doesn't realize necessarily that that's the way the world could be or used to be. And ecologically, I'm not sure that a big sea turtle was going to give this 225 pound tiger shark the same birth or, or show the same fear response or be eaten by this 225 pound shark at the same rate or in the same way that this 900 pound shark could be scaring turtles and other large fishes uh, or eating them and removing them from the system to maintain balance. Okay, now I want to jump to uh, what we've been doing here in North Carolina. Uh, this is our logo for our long-term shark survey, uh, which began back at least in the early 70s with sampling, even going back to the early 60s. Here are some very uh, brief notes on the survey. Uh, the first sets were made in the late 60s, uh, led by a professor named Dr. Frank Schwartz, who some of you at the museum have met and worked with uh, going back decades. Uh, currently, we do this survey bi-weekly, spring, summer, and fall. We have two stations uh, south of Shackleford Banks where we uh, survey the sharks. We call it inshore and offshore. They're, fairly, they're both fairly inshore, relatively speaking. Over the course of the survey, we put out uh, over 150,000 baited hooks, um, and we've caught almost, we're creeping up very close to 11,000 individual sharks that we've caught and measured and surveyed. And that represents 23 different species. Um, so if we think about 50 species of shark can show up in North Carolina, we've uh, captured about half of them in our survey. One thing I always like to tell people is that sharks are hard to work with for a number of reasons, their size, their mobility, and they're fairly hard to tell apart. I mean, most of them are gray on top or white on the bottom, and they've got some black fin tips. And so it's easy to lump sharks. And again, in those tournament records I was showing you, a shark was just a shark until 1980. They didn't even tell you that it was a, a, a tiger shark or a bull shark until late in the game. Um, so we all are trying to understand how unique these sharks are ecologically. Um, you know, you might be able to tell from looking at this one, this is a bonnet head. Maybe you said hammerhead, but it's a bonnet head. Does it perform the same ecological role as this shark right here, which might be uh, an Atlantic shark moves or some other small species versus this shark, which is probably not a sandbar based upon the dorsal fin height, but you know how different or similar are these species? So what do we think we can use this survey to, to help us with? Um, well, the first is seasonality. And if things are changing because of climate shifts, the phenology or seasonal timing of things could be one of those. We want to understand long-term population dynamics, and so you've got to be out there in the long term. We do see differences between what we call the inshore and offshore sets. And then I'm going to show you data about what's going on within individual species in terms of their sizes over time. And then we also are interested in movement migration patterns of these sharks. This is something that I hope over time that we do even better um, with the new technologies that are out there, if we can get grants to, to fund that work. Uh, and then we pick up other applications. Some people may want to do some physio physiology. Some people may want to do some morphological stuff. Some people just need tissue samples. And so we try to be a vessel of opportunity to help people get um, things they need. In fact, the museum is interested in, in developing a tissue collection, which we hope to, to help with in the next couple of years. 
So really quickly, this long-term survey, what is it we do when we go out every other week? So we use a, a long line, which is a one kilometer long main line that has these Gangen lines with hooks about every 10 meters apart. Um, so we go out, we trawl for bait, we catch things like spot and croaker that we attach to the hooks, 100 hooks per set. Uh, those uh, baited hooks go out on the long line, which again spans a kilometer. Uh, that line soaks for an hour and then we pull it in. Uh, this is usually in the morning. Um, we do the inshore and offshore sets, or we flip it. We do the offshore then inshore sets. Uh, this is an unanchored uh, long line. A lot of people who do survey stuff like this elsewhere might use a bottom anchored long line, but we've maintained our survey the way it was initiated for consistency's sake. Um, and we have these floats every so often, so the line can sort of go through the water column, different hooks are at different depths. Uh, all the sharks that we capture get ID'd, uh, we get length measurements, either total length or fork length, fork length being where the tail forks. Um, we figure out if it's male or female, we do insert a small um, spaghetti tag and then we release them. And about 90% of our sharks are logged as released in good condition. Uh, we do keep some for educational purposes or if DMF needs some or if somebody else needs some for any sort of purpose, we try to maximize the utility of the survey. And most of the data that we show you get standardized to a catch per unit effort. If we do twice as much effort in a day, we expect to catch twice as many sharks. So to standardize that catch rate, we often report the number of sharks caught per hundred hooks. Okay. This is kind of the upshot of, of the species that we see most frequently. Um, we see a lot of Atlantic sharp nose sharks, about one third of all the individual sharks are Atlantic sharp nose. And we see a fair number of black nose. Um, the last trip we made, we caught four black nose. And that's the only species we saw. Um, sharp nose are usually a little bit less than a meter. Black nose can be a little bit bigger than a meter. And that's about half of all the individual sharks that, that we catch out there. We also see uh, a number of other species, uh, again, a lot of requiem sharks, um, uh, with a couple of exceptions. Uh, we see duskies, about one out of every 10 sharks historically was a dusky. We see a lot of black tips. Um, we see sandbars, which have the high dorsal fin. We see spinners. So again, they're all kind of gray on the top, white on the bottom with black fin tips. And even a black tip, ironically enough, the key idea in it is that it doesn't have a black tip on its anal fin. Uh, spinners uh, have a very distinct black tip on their anal fin. So again, we, we've only in the last few decades really been able to say with some consistency, like it's this shark or that shark or that shark, trying to understand their ecological roles and how they maybe overlap or be different is where we're at now and where our interests are currently within our lab specifically. Okay, uh, we see a couple of the larger charismatic species, scallop hammerheads, about one out of every 20 sharks is a scallop hammerhead, uh, and we do see some tiger sharks. Um, these photos are a bit older, and I will just say uh, intently, uh, what we've learned about handling sharks has changed over time, and we no longer try to lift sharks up by their hammer, cephalofoil, or by the tail, um, but this is a part of the past of the way that sampling was done. I'll also say, along with our tagging stuff, um, just this morning I had a call in of one of our tagged tiger sharks, and I haven't connected with the individual yet to find out the details, but he said he caught it right at the port here in Moorhead City. <laughs> um, and so I'm eager to call him back and find out which ID tag that was so we can see when and when we tagged that tiger shark and which, which size tiger shark it may have been. But that happened as a coincidence just today. Okay. So uh, this graph is a little bit messy, but it's not too hard to understand. This is the relative frequency of occurrence of different species. Each species gets its own color. And on the x-axis, you basically got the seasons, right? April through November. And the sharks are moving up and down the coast in response to temperature. So some species that we see in the summer spend their winter in Florida, perhaps. The species of shark that we see in the winter, they go up to New England for their summer. And 
here are temperature data just taken from the shark survey every time we go out in different seasons what the temperature was and it seems like 25 degrees C is a real important switch. At 25 degrees C, we see that shift from the wintertime species or transient species to what I might call like our summertime residents. Um, and so here in this first uh, image, a few things to take away is maybe this crimson, if you're seeing it crimson where my cursor is, there's a species that shows up in the spring and then it shows up in the fall. This is a shark that was in Florida, maybe, in the winter. It passes us by in the spring on its way north. It spends its summer to the north of us, and then it passes us back by in the fall when it's heading back south. And uh, this is a dusky, um, dusky sharks. You know, pretty good size shark, can be six, seven, eight foot long. In the summer, we historically have seen things like a lot of black noses, a lot of spinners, and um, a lot of black tips. And so that's some of these colors you see here that are really peaking in relative frequency in the summer. This is a snapshot of the 1970s, okay? Now let's look at a snapshot of the 1980s. It looks reasonably similar, uh, maybe with some slight adjustments. Probably the main thing to notice is there's more orange. And these are the sharp-nosed sharks. Now when we move from the 80s into the 90s, you're gonna see a big change. Here are the 1990s. It's becoming dominated by the orange, which are the sharp nose. Very, very few duskies. Um, not as many things like silkies, not as many things like sandbars. Uh, into the early, uh, well, into the 2000s, it's a sharp nose world. The world has, the shark world has become all sharp nose. And then data from the last decade. And I suppose if I were going to squint my eyes and, and try to make a best guess, I would say maybe I'm a little bit encouraged that it seems like the diversity has gone back up a little bit in the 2000s and 10s relative to the 2000s. So there's 2000s, there's 2010s, there's 2000s, there's 2010s. Maybe we're starting to, to be not so dominated by just sharp nose. And this is in the context of a lot of conservation efforts and management of sharks designed to conserve sharks that started in the mid 1990s. And so it's probably taken 20 years for those efforts to start to have an effect at population scales. So this is a really exciting time to be involved in the survey because we've gone through this period where we lost a bunch of sharks to look like, and now maybe we're just starting to see an uptick in some species perhaps. Now, why would this change in the community matter here locally? Uh, so this is a, a science paper, probably the top magazine that people like us try to publish in, uh, with some authors, Pete Peterson and Sean Powers, who were here at IMS, involved in this survey. And what they did is they compared this change over time in the really big sharks. So it seems like the really big sharks are going down, down, down in numbers. And they asked, well, what do big sharks eat? Well, here's a sand tiger that we caught recently. And probably the reason we caught this sand tiger is because we had first hooked a little sharp nose shark. And big sharks love to eat little sharks. And big sharks love to eat things like rays. And so this paper makes the hypothesis that as we've lost the big sharks, maybe things like cow nose rays have increased in numbers. Because again, like turtles in that other example, now they're out of bounds. And what do these cow nose rays love to eat? Well, at times they love to eat scallops. And so here are some data from North Carolina bay scallop numbers over time, which are going down, down, down. And so there's this idea of a cascade through the ecosystem that we lost the sharks, what they call mesopredators or rays have increased. And then the prey of the mesopredators, so the scallops have gone down. And there's probably a lot of truth in this. I will say this is really a functional hypothesis. It's hard to actually prove this. And there are other mechanisms that could explain some of these dynamics. But a really influential paper that's come out of this survey. All right, uh, by my math, I've got on the order of five to 10 minutes. So I'm gonna uh, try to keep right on that schedule. Um, interestingly enough though, we've looked at sizes within species. So not just have we lost the biggest species, What's happening within each individual species? And so this is a paper we published just last year. 
So for 12 different species, big things like uh, hammerheads, duskies, but also relatively small sharks like black noses and sharp noses. How have the sizes of these shark species changed in the survey through time? And the short answer is, is that for every single species that we have enough data to even do the analysis, black tips, duskies, hammerheads, silky, spinners, but also sharp nose, every single species, the sizes are going down. Now, why is this? That's hard to answer. Uh, it could be that maybe just more baby sharks are coming into our area. And as we measure more baby sharks, that pulls our sizes down. We have ways of looking at the data to buffer for that. It may be that um, they fished out all the big ones and these populations just haven't recovered. It could be the ecosystem has changed in a way that doesn't support as big of, as big of sharks within each of these species. So this is a pattern. Now we've got to go try to figure out the mechanism. And that's going to be hard to do, but we're here to, to tackle that over the next few years or even decades. But it seems like fishing or the ecosystem effects we're having, if it is us, and I think it's probably humans that are driving this, we're not just affecting the big sharks, we're affecting sharks sort of universally in terms of their populations, um, at least the, the presence of, of big sharks. Okay, so I mentioned that we're not only interested in counting them, but we're trying to do uh, work on movement ecology and where they go. Uh, all the sharks we catch, here's a little dusky. It's a really hard one to tell, but it does have an interdorsal ridge, we think. So it came out as a dusky. It gets this little spaghetti tag. So when we put it back in the water, if you catch it or someone else catches it a year from now, they can call it back in and we at least know where the shark ended up after a year. And like I mentioned, just this morning, someone told me they caught a shark that was tagged right at the port, a tiger shark. So a, a pretty big one, perhaps. Um, We've also used acoustic tags. Uh, this tag sends out a ping, ping, ping. I'll talk about this a bit more. And then we and other people are trying to use things like pop-off tags. So this tag rides around on the back of a fish. Uh, could be a shark. Here's a sheep's head. It's the photo I had handy. Uh, after a while, the tag actually releases. It goes to the surface, and it transmits to a satellite all the movement of, of that individual. So we're trying to understand how these sharks move around with every different tool that we have in our arsenal. Uh, we've also tried some drone work to see if we can use drones to survey for sharks. Um, we first did this with bonnet heads because they do swim in such shallow water. Um, so here's an overhead, uh, a photo actually taken at the aquarium here in Pinal Shores. This is actually a live bonnet head. If you didn't quite focus uh, on the photo enough, you may not realize this is just a mimic of a, of a bonnet head so that we can put out the mimic where, where we want to and see if the drone can actually see the mimic. Uh, the data here are how deep we put these mimics or decoys and our ability to see the shark with drones. And the answer is in our system, when it gets more than a meter deep, it's very, very hard to see sharks. They're just so well camouflaged from the top down that they become almost invisible with their background. So maybe in very shallow water, you could do some shark survey work, but probably not anything deeper than, let's say, a meter and a half uh, for a, a, a decent size shark. Back to this acoustic tagging stuff. Um, we've worked primarily with bonnet heads. Uh, I really like bonnet heads. They're the size of a shark that you can actually kind of work with, uh, get your hands on. I've been told by someone I trust that they have the softest bite in the shark universe. So if you were ever going to stick your hand in a shark's mouth, uh, a bonnet head would be the shark maybe to, to do that with. Uh, when you look inside their stomachs, all they have in their stomachs here is just blue crabs. It's blue crab, blue crab, blue crab. And the blue crabs are whole. They're not chewed up. It's like they've just been slurped up very lovingly uh, by the shark and then just kind of passed down the, uh, the gullet fairly, fairly gently. So we catch these bonnet heads and we put one of these acoustic tags on its dorsal fin. The tag goes chirp, chirp, chirp as the fish swims around. We also then put out all these little boxes that are listening stations for that chirp, chirp, chirp. We've done this with bonnet head sharks here in North Carolina. All of these dots are where we have listening stations for our tag sharks. We've also done it in Georgia uh, with a colleague down in Georgia, but I'm only gonna talk about the North Carolina stuff. And so some of the things we've learned uh, about bonnet heads uh, in this work are what you're seeing here is you're seeing 
individually tagged shark. So this is, you know, shark number one, shark number two, all these are my hits. About 20 or 25 different sharks. Time is on the x-axis. And if you see a black line, that means we're detecting the shark somewhere in our array. So it's here in our array. Uh, a bunch of tags went out uh, in the middle of June in 2016. And what we've learned is that these sharks are here until maybe the end of September or the beginning of October, and they all leave. They all XR estuary. And these individual sharks can get picked up on other people's arrays that have listing stations out, sometimes in South Carolina or Georgia or Florida. Uh, so these are the places these sharks went during the winter. And the sharks show back up in May, and they spend the summer um, in our system. We also know that locally, they really, really, really like the inlet. They don't venture far from, you know, this is Beaufort Inlet uh, right here near Beaufort, North Carolina. They don't venture into other areas where we have listening stations. They just like the inlet. Interestingly enough, we also know that all of these sharks, 99% of them are female. Um, but we can't absolutely say that they're in here to release pups. We've never caught a neonate bonnethead shark in any of these estuarine systems where we work. If you go out in the ocean, on the ocean side, two thirds of all the bonnet heads you catch are male. So there's clearly some gender partitioning for some reason that may be related to reproductive ecology, but it's still a bit of a mystery, at least to me, and I think to us about why they're doing that. We also know uh, one more point is that even if we tag fish in Georgia or if other people tag fish in Florida, bonnet heads, I should say, they all go to these same places. So the bonnet heads in the winter are all going to the same place somewhere offshore in the ocean. And then in the summer, they separate and they come back to the estuaries along the coast where they were the previous year for the most part. Uh, I've got like two minutes. I'm just going to speak quickly about some of the trophic ecology we're doing. So trophically speaking, uh, the carbon, nitrogen, and sulfur isotopes that you have in your body or I have in my body or the shark has in its body are indicative of the types of things it eats, where the primary production comes from, what sort of salinity environment that primary production might have been in, also what trophic level you sit at. Are you a low trophic level primary producer? Are you an apex predator, largely based upon the nitrogen signal that we see? So using these isotopes, we can explore the trophic ecology of different sharks. And at the moment, we focused on um, four of our really common summertime sharks. That's the sharp nose, bonnet heads, black tips, and black noses. We've also used multiple tissue types because different tissue types have different turnover times. So some tissues that turn over once a year, that tells you the integrated diet over the last year. Other tissues that turn over once a month, that tells you the diet from the last month. And so we can look to see if these sharks are actually having differences in diet for their whole seasonal migration pattern versus when they're just here in North Carolina, like for the summer, using different tissues. And I'm only gonna show you a bit of data. I'm sorry, this is fairly involved, um, but I think conceptually you'll get it pretty quickly if you don't already know these types of graphs. But looking at just what they're doing trophically in the summer, if you look at the different isotopic markers we have, be it carbon or nitrogen or sulfur, notice that this, this purple circle tends to be distinct from the others, and that's a bonnet head. A bonnet head is doing something very different ecologically, trophically, than the other species. And again, they're really a blue crab consumption factory. Something like in a sharp nose, it has a very wide trophic niche. So it's a generalist. Something like a black tip, it looks like it's a specialist. One of the things that black tips eats is a part of the generalist sharp nose diet, but this happens to be something like menhaden uh, or mullet. So really black tips are menhaden and mullet specialists, whereas a sharp nose is like a generalist. And a, a black nose falls somewhere in between where it's not as generalist as a sharp nose or as specialist as a, as a, black, as a black tip. So we're learning more about the different roles these sharks play. All right, last couple slides. Um, I mentioned before that I'm slightly optimistic. We just need another decade or two of data, but I'm optimistic that maybe we're turning a corner and we are going to recover some of these sharks that have gotten gone from the system. 
Um, here's a paper that um, some NOAA folks published. This is not our data, but just the title is Preliminary Recovery of Coastal Sharks in the Southeast. Their survey data are actually pretty far offshore of ours. Um, our data set is really inshore by comparison. But I'm just showing you the catches of tiger sharks over a period of time and the sizes of those tiger sharks. So again, in the 70s and early 80s, they caught a lot of tiger sharks. And then starting at about 1988 or 89, they caught a few small tiger sharks, but basically went 20 years without ever catching a tiger shark. And then over the last six, seven, eight years, I really need to update this because this graph is, I made this graph in like 2018 or 19. But every year now we catch a couple or three tiger sharks and they're pretty big, right? These are pretty big sharks. And so, and here's one from a few years ago. So yeah, I do think that in the case of tiger sharks, I'm a little bit optimistic. In the case of dusky sharks, I'm a little bit optimistic. In the case of hammerheads, I'm a little bit optimistic. But in the 10 years that I've been helping lead this, uh, I think I've seen one silky and I've seen very few sandbars. So we have some species that appear to be doing maybe a little bit better and some that are still lagging behind. But it's an interesting time to be involved in this because the next couple of decades are gonna tell a tale that we, we don't quite know what to expect yet. All right, so to wrap this up, um, I want to make a very specific point here. Um, you may take away different things from this slide, but the point that I'm going to try to make, whatever you think the point I'm trying to make is, the point is, is that big fish play important roles in our coastal systems. And we have evidence from our survey work that we've certainly changed the fundamental size structure of the shark community. And that's going to change the roles they play in the top-down sense. Um, these patterns manifest over decades in some cases. And so it's really critical to have this grassroots, uh, grassroots uh, investment from your labs, I think, at the coast to, to be out there doing that work to try to keep a, a finger on the, the current state um, of where sharks are relative to some long-term uh, framework, which we now have 50 years of, of data to build on. I apologize if I ran a couple, three minutes long. I probably did. I'm pretty long-winded. I uh, certainly want to acknowledge the people that have funded this stuff and the hundreds of staff, faculty, students, volunteers that have gone out on the survey or helped do different things with the shark work we do. And then I believe if there's time, we'll, we'll take questions. Thank you. Yes, there should be time. I mean, there absolutely is. First of all, thank you so much, Dr. Fadri, for that wonderful presentation. My favorite part was seeing how shifts in shark populations have cascading effects on other species, such as scallops. You know, the world's ecosystems are very interdependent, and it's always interesting to see how that plays out right here in North Carolina. Now, am I showing up? Yes, okay. So I did have a couple of questions. So I thought it was really fascinating how you used the deep sea fishing rodeo data to approximate places where we didn't necessarily have numbers at that time. Are there any other methods that you have to approximate historical data or anything interesting down the avenue, of getting creative to fill in the gaps? Yeah, so it, I mean, it is fun to be creative and we try to be. Um, most fish, fishes don't leave good historical records. Um, you know, we don't have this ability to go take an ice core. I'm very jealous of the people that can take an ice core or tree rings and then recover, you know, climate patterns over decades and centuries, millennia. Um, so there are not probably a ton of ways to recover stories like that. If we weren't out there in the 20s and 30s, um, it is a bit lost to us. You can cobble together approximations uh, to take a bit of a leap. Um, you know, ship logs used to record, you know, how many turtles they would catch in terms of uh, feeding the crew and people have poured through uh, um, those ship logs to try to recover how many turtles might have once been in the coastal ocean of the Caribbean or the Southeast or other places. I will say that it's been really fun. I haven't found as many ways that I'd like to to publish with it, but newspapers are a treasure trove of information going back in time, especially for people like me 
those papers based in Charleston, South Carolina, or Mobile, Alabama, or Wilmington, North Carolina, because two centuries ago, a hundred years ago, their their window into the world and where they faced was towards the water, right? They didn't face Highway 70 to go to from Moorhead to Raleigh. That's that wasn't where information arrived. Everybody was looking out of the water. And the things that you see in these papers about the observations they were making and the way the water impacted their lives meant that what's in the papers is primarily about things going on in and around the water. What ships arrived or what events happened, what storms, um, you know, jubilees are this thing that happened in the Gulf. What well, happened in lots of places, but in the Gulf, they call them jubilees where fish, flounders and crabs will just pile up on the shore. And that happened because of hypoxia and oxy events in places like Mobile Bay. And you don't read the science part in the paper, but you just read that, wow, like last Thursday, everybody went down to the shore and collected all the flounders and the crabs. And if you have the right lens or the right, you know, theory in which you understand those reports, then you could make probably a neat database out of some of these things. So there are, there are real treasures um, behind me. It is, I saw them behind me. These are the old fishery bulletin reports that go back to the 1880s. And I've just been thumbing through them. And the, the observations that were made and some of the data pieces that are in there are striking. And none of us have enough time or probably spend enough time trying to mine some of that information. And so some of us like me, we probably reinvent the wheel every now and then because we don't know what was done or what was learned and sometimes forgotten. Sorry if that's a bit of a random rambling explanation, but you got me going. Oh, no, thank you so much. Now we have some questions from the chat, from the live stream. So our first question is, how do researchers account for selection bias when conducting these surveys, considering that certain sharks might prefer some types of bait over others or might be generally harder to catch? Yeah, that's a good question. So let me answer that in two ways. Number one is, let me go back to that, those tournament records from the Gulf of Mexico. E even worse than just selection bias, because again, I mentioned there's all these biases of bigger boats, better gears, more people. So in those first 60 years, when you see the winning sharks getting bigger, that's probably a bias of all those factors. It's not a real signal. Um, what I would say, in that, in that, and those are fishery dependent data, right? So in that case, they're not trying to do a standardized survey. They're just trying to go with a fisher app. And if gas gets twice as expensive, you might have half the participants. And so your numbers change because of nothing to do with sharks, just because of the price of gas. So we have to be very aware of those types of biases. What I say in that particular case is we understand the bias. And if sharks stay big, we have to understand that maybe that's driven by just better boats and more people. The fact that sharks sort of fall off a cliff it's hard to explain that with those biases I just mentioned. If anything, those biases should be maintaining some big fish because the boats are so good now and the gears are so good now. So in that case, the biases to me are a conservative factor that our patterns are even sort of more believable. So that's one thing I wanted to say. I think your question was more about our standardized shark survey that we do um, here. And we have to limit how we interpret some things. So as a, for instance, um, of the 11,000 sharks that we've caught, this is basically true, um, if, if slightly wrong, I think we've caught three sand tigers. Now, I believe that sand tigers are a bigger part of the community than that catch rate as a function of our whole catch rate. But we're not putting our gear near structure because we get hung on the structure and sand tigers like structure. Like funny enough, for whatever reason, of those three sand tigers, and let's say it's five, let's say it's six sand tigers, whatever. Two of them we caught last year on back-to-back -back trips. And random chance or when we put out that gear, did some sort of feature in the sand. I mean, you get humps of sand out there, you get, you know, you get, you get shoals that move around, had a shoal of sand moved in in a way that was more conducive for sand tigers to, to be in there. I also mentioned that um, 
that the best way to catch something like a sand tiger or a big tiger or a big hammerhead, half the time we catch one, there's a little sharp nose or a small shark also on the hook. And the big shark has come after the little shark, right? And so how do you deal with, with that, um, with that bias? I don't have a good answer for it. What I can tell you this is, is that to me, the power of the data set is to be out for decades and to see gigantic shifts in um, the data set. So if there is a bias between the catchability of sharp nose and duskies, I can totally believe it. But we've been doing the same thing for 50 years. So how do you go from mostly duskies to mostly sharp nose if it's a gear bias thing? That's probably more of a change in the community thing. But yeah, inherently sharp nose may be more catchable than duskies because of the size bait we use or the nature of the hook. The oh, so so one thing we want to do, I just haven't got my rear end to do it, is I am interested in every time we go out, there's like there's this long list of things I'd like to do. So we just gotta get around to do them all. Every time we go out, I would like to hang a GoPro camera on that chain that goes down to the hook. And maybe do that on five or six different hooks. And then we can just watch what happens. And most of the time, we'll probably not see anything, right? Because most of the hooks actually don't catch a shark. But what we may see is we may see a little fish comes and takes the bait or a crab comes and gets the bait because some of the hooks come back to us with no bait on. Um, but we'll also see the way that sharks interact with the bait a little bit within that field of view. We'll see that if, if spinners just come in and grab without even thinking, and if duskies come in and, and, and nudge it a little bit, you know, or things like that. So there are, there are some ways to get a better context of those factors. But I think that the power of this data set largely relies on the consistency. And so we're really looking at temporal changes. And so the, the selectivity biases shouldn't have changed dramatically over time. Um, but it may explain why we catch more sharp nose than, than black nose. Sure, that, that is a possibility. So you also look at other pieces of data to see if your survey, you know, approximates other people's way of looking at the world. There are things you can do, but it's, it's an issue um, for sure. But not a, it doesn't kill us, I hope. Well, thank you. That was very insightful. Now we do have a question re regarding the nitrogen, sulfur, and carbon levels in the water regarding the isotopes how that works uh, chemically, and if you verify the values with their suspected prey of the different sharks. Yeah, so um, I'm gonna actually share, am I still sharing screen? I'm still sharing screen, let me go back. I did have to run through that pretty quickly. So um, these terms here, del 13 C, it really means the isotopic ratio, the stable isotopic ratios that are out there. How much C13 versus C12, nitrogen 15 versus nitrogen 14, and sulfur 34 versus, I'm a bit injured, maybe 33. Uh, I work with stable isotopologists. I am not a stable isotopologist myself. So carbon, the, the ratio of 13 to 12 that makes up that del 13 signature, um, it changes across seagrass and salt marsh and phytoplankton and uh, um, epi, epiphytes and um, detrital pools of seagrass or salt marsh. And yes, to your question, we go out and we sample all those. And so we directly know um, the signatures of each of those sources of primary production. Now, what we the values that we get in the summer might be different than the values we get in the fall, and the values that we get here might be different than the values against South Carolina. So it's always important to kind of ground truth those signals. You can't do it one time and then say we've got the perfect picture of these sig signatures across all time and all places. Um, in the in the case of sulfur, um, it can help separate the the phytoplankton primary production versus things that are benthic. And it also seems that signature also seems to vary across salinities. So it helps us figure out how much was more fresh based primary production versus salty primary production. And so you put all these things together, now you start to get some resolution. These are 
these are good. These are not as precise as some other things. I even forget the names, but you can go into specific amino acids and you can get even higher resolution so that you can not only say that this came through something like a demersal fish, that's what we can do most of the time, but you might be able to say this came through something that was like a very close to a menhaden. And then I didn't show these data because they're really not mine, but we partnered with someone on our main campus. And every time in this study that we got a tissue sample to these table isotopes, uh, they took a fecal swab. And so they're going to do eDNA work to look at uh, the diet composition based upon the eDNA signatures. And we've actually, I've seen the data and I'm reasonably pleased with the agreement. When we think it's like a, you know, a, a croaker spot type diet, that's what the eDNA stuff is mostly confirming. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll, in the interest of time, I'll stop there, but that's a, that's a first stab at trying to explain a little further how these, these things work. It's not perfect resolution. Like using stable isotopes, I can't say that a black tip shark eats mullet, but I do know that it has a similar signature that you would expect if mullet was its primary prey. And then when we do have a black tip that doesn't survive capture or for whatever reason, and we've looked in its stomach, we try to confirm it, hey, we, we find mullet every now and then, or we if we never find mullet and we always find shrimp, we would start to question our own biomarker data because these things wouldn't be lining up appropriately. So that's kind of basically how. All right, thank you. Now we don't have a lot of time, but I just wanted to ask, you know, sharks are fairly misunderstood creatures. There are a lot of misconceptions. Just, we only have a couple minutes here, but how has the ability of the public to follow along as researchers discover more information about sharks really helped clear up some misconceptions? Yeah, um, certainly attitudes have changed dramatically. It, it sounds a little funny to say it, but I, you can never, I think, understate how important Jaws was as like a watershed event that just changed people's whole take on sharks. Like it really did make sharks uh, persona non grata. There was no shame in catching and killing sharks for a decade or two. They just, you know, they were dangerous. They didn't have a lot of value. Since the late 80s or early 90s, there's been just a, I think, a fundamental shift. And you can't, you also can't, I think, understate, it sounds kind of corny, and it's changed over time in terms of what it is, but this Shark Week thing that just it was on Discovery Channel, like, really did get into the public consciousness. And it's coming up, you know, this week or next week, and maybe now it's a whole month and multiple stations do something shark related. And so there has been, I think, a paradigm shift in terms of the way people feel about sharks. Most people don't know the specifics of what sharks do. But they do have this loose sense that they're, they belong in the coastal ocean and they do important things. Um, you know, I, again, I think sharks are really hard to identify for most people. So most people probably don't appreciate there's 30 different species that show up in North Carolina fairly commonly. Um, one thing that I've learned about sharks over time is that they're incredibly skittish. Uh, you know, bull sharks may be kind of an outlier. They're a little more aggressive when whatever happens, happens. But sharks, by and large... They're doing three things. They're trying to find food. They're trying to find a mate. And the rest of their time, they're trying to avoid danger. It's just so easy to spook a shark um, that I think most people don't appreciate how risk adverse sharks are. Um, you know, these blue moon attacks that happen, I get it. Like it's the, the stakes are high. It's scary to have your day ruined or your life changed. Or in North Carolina, I think it's two or three people die from shark attacks. So the stakes scare people, but if people focused on the odds, they wouldn't think twice about it. The odds are so incredibly low. Um, I'm always struck that I'm not even sure we've had an attack in North Carolina this year. If we did, I missed it. But um, the fact that it averages two or three attacks when you have millions of people in the water each year, spending millions of hours in the water, and the sharks are right there. I mean, that's a, that's a reality. That's where they live. But the fact that we talk about an average of two or three attacks in North Carolina every year is just amazing to me and it highlights how skittish sharks must be of humans. Well, thank you so much. Now, it looks like we're out of time, but Dr. F Dr. Fodry, thank you so much for being on this program today and sharing your research with us. Yeah, thank you all very much. This was a pleasure to do and hopefully uh, if you need to be in touch or have a reason to be in touch, we're, we're, here, to, we're here to serve. All right, thank you. And for our viewers, thank you for watching today's program. Make sure you follow the museum on social media 
at Natural Sciences on all platforms. And make sure you follow the North Carolina Office of Environmental Education, which is at North Carolina EE. And we'll see y'all next time. Bye.